we're live. Uh, I'd like to call the uh, Tuesday, November 13th, uh, Davie County School Board meeting to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to adopt the agenda. Have a motion by Ms. Owens, have a second. Second by uh, Mr. Fuller. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Next item on the agenda is I need a motion to go into closed session to preserve the attorney client privilege pursuant to the North Carolina general statutes listed on our agenda to discuss personnel matters protected by state law and to discuss student matters made confidential Wait a minute, by do we have student matters? Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. General sure. statutes and FERPA. So moved. Have a motion. Second. Have a second by Colonel Hills. All in favor? We're in closed session. I'd like to uh, reconvene our uh, regular scheduled uh, meeting of the Davie County School Board and like to welcome you uh, to our meeting tonight. Uh, the first item on the agenda is our invocation. Loving and gracious God, we thank you today for all your blessings, for the successful outcomes of our school events, and for all of our staff members. We ask that you bless them abundantly and we continue to seek your wisdom, guidance, courage and strength. Be with us in our deliberations and help us to be wise in the decisions we make for the good of all those who have placed their trust and confidence in us. Give us insight to lead with integrity that our decisions may reflect what is right and good. Keep us from short-sightedness and pettiness. Help us to make decisions that are good for all and guard us from blind self-interest. The Lord grant us the humility to always seek your will in all that we do and say, amen. Next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and we're being led, led by Scout Pack 574. I put Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, guys. Next item on the agenda is uh, the approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? I have a motion by Ms. Owens. I have a second by Colonel Hales. Any discussion? All those in, oh, that is for both sets. Sorry. Any other questions? All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, important dates. And I'll go over a couple. Uh, we're right in the middle of the North Carolina School Board Annual Conference uh, in Greensboro, and Colonel Hales, Mr. Drexler, and Mr. Potts attended that. And I would also like to recognize and congratulate uh, Mr. Potts on being selected as a board member. So thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, means a lot. Uh, this uh, uh, one, one kind of, we expect great things out of him. <laughs> as great as always. <laughs> as always. I just wanted to share that. Uh, tomorrow at 1130, we have a Board of Education lunch at the Davie County Early College. We always look forward to those lunches. Uh, Thursday, uh, we have a Stars of the Year banquet at the Granary at Winmock. That starts at 6 p.m. And then we're on to Thanksgiving, uh, which is crazy. Uh, getting into December, uh, we have a farewell uh, reception uh, for Dr. Hartness at 3.30 to 5 uh, here in the boardroom. Uh, then let's say our meeting is that night and I will go ahead and say as well that on December the 5th at 4 p.m. it's not on our uh, in our board agenda but December 5th at 4 p.m. we will have a, uh, an official tour of the field house out at the football field and track at the new high school what time? 4 p.m. December the 5th hmm? and then the 10th we have a drop-in social for holiday Crazy. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the 2019 uh, meeting dates 
for the Board of Education. Uh, if you have had a chance to look at those and hadn't seen any conflicts, uh, the first Tuesday of the month, except for those uh, exceptions, uh, January and July and September. And just entertain a motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion by Colonel Hills. I have a second by Ms. Owens. Any discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries 7 0. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hartman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. It's cold outside. You notice that? Uh, it feels like winter already, and it's just November the 13th. Uh, while winter is just arriving, unfortunately, we've already missed three days of school. Um, I've told a number of people that never in my 27 years have I canceled afternoon bus service. But that was Jeremy Miller's idea <laughs> on October the 11th. I told him, I said, did Todd not train us for this event? Uh, so we had a very interesting afternoon on October the 11th. And hope, hopefully, Jeremy, we will never have that opportunity again. But the good news was everybody arrived home safely that afternoon, and we made the best decisions we could make with the information that we had. We missed on, uh, one day of school on October the 12th. Would remind everyone all of the changes to the school calendar for both staff and students has been posted on our district website. I want to congratulate uh, Chairman Junker on his re-election to the board. Also, Ms. Lori Smith and David Carroll for their election to the board. They're going to be sworn in in December. And in December, we will also be recognizing Mr. Chad Fuller and Barbara Owens for their faithful service to Davie County Schools. So we look forward to, to that event in December. A lot of things happened in the month of October. We opened a new student-run credit union at Davie County High School. I want to thank those board members who were able to join us in that attendance and Congressman Ted Budd, who was there that afternoon at the ribbon-cutting of the new student-run credit union. So congratulations, uh, Mr. Dole Nicholson and the staff there for a, a great program. We had a visit in October from Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest at Coolamie Elementary School. We congratulate Coolamie Elementary School for... Um, Ms. Stone and the staff and students for being recognized in the top 4% of North Carolina elementary schools in academic growth. That's quite an accomplishment. We're really proud of them and, and they are being recognized by state leaders. I want to thank Representative Julia Howard and Senator Dan Barrett who joined the Lieutenant Governor at Cool Me for that visit. Veterans Day is a very special time in our nation and in our community. Uh, we are forever grateful for the many men and women who put their lives on the line for the freedoms that we enjoy. And I want to publicly say thank you to our principals and our staff and students for the many ways that they have recognized our veterans in our schools. That's an important part of what we're teaching young people and a, a part of our curriculum. Um, lastly, tonight is the last official board meeting for our Chief Financial Officer, Deborah Miller. Um, Deborah, I want to say a few things about you tonight, so bear with me, okay? Uh, Deborah has served as our district finance officer since 2005. I have enjoyed working with her for the last seven and a half years, and I want to reflect on a few things about Deborah's tenure. Things have not always run as smooth as they run today. Before I get to the many positives about Deborah's tenure, I want to remind the board that Deborah has not always been treated fairly or professionally in our community. Before I arrived in 2011, our county commission put together, um, a, a actually commissioned a study of the efficiency and effectiveness of Davie County Public Schools. Uh, at that point in time, the majority of commissioners had little confidence in our school system, and that study found a very efficient school system. And I think Deborah Miller and the finance staff here are a big part and responsible for the findings of that study. Um, during that time, Deborah wasn't always treated fairly in public meetings. She was put on the spot by what I called a few people in Davie County until that they discovered that our district was well-managed and it was run by well-prepared, hard-working professionals. Deborah and our staff rose above that criticism and did not take personally the constant attacks that our finance office was under. 
Thankfully, people in our community recognized the hard work and dedication of our finance staff, and that unfair treatment ended in the next election. But there are many bright spots in Deborah's tenure as our CFO. She and our finance staff have been repeatedly recognized for their accuracy, integrity, and diligence in all of our annual audits for their work. Deborah's recognized across North Carolina as an experienced <coughs> finance officer among her peers and among state leaders and officials. She helped to guide our district through the Great Recession of 2008-2009, and she helped to manage our local, state, and federal resources that allowed adjustments to staff over a period of time and prevented layoffs. Deborah managed many financial transactions of multiple capital projects throughout her career, the largest being $62 million in construction funding for the new Davie County High School. Few CPAs or finance officers manage a budget of $55 million, but Deborah has done that with grace and professionalism, and she understands how school finances differ from the private sector. Deborah, thank you for your service to our district. Mm -hmm. As Deborah moves to Allentown, Pennsylvania, her hometown, to be closer to family and to work in the private sector, we, we all wish you much continued success. Thank you. Give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The man who hired me is sitting two people away from me here. But thank you all. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here in Davie County and um, um, I have many fond memories, and um, I won't be a stranger. I'm sure I'll be around for visits, but thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. And related to, uh, to Deborah's uh, new ventures in life, I have reassigned Tammy Naylor to serve as our interim chief financial officer beginning December the 1st. Tammy has worked for our district for many years. Uh, she began her relationship with Davie County Schools as an outside auditor and then came to work for the school system. She served as our finance officer. For the last several years, she served in our preschool department managing the district resources for preschool. So I really appreciate her willingness to step in during this transition time. Um, she will manage our district resources extremely well. Last thing I'll say is Thanksgiving is just around the corner and we all have so much for which to give thanks. And I wish each and every one of you a wonderful Thanksgiving season. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ms. Miller. It's been a pleasure. <coughs> uh, you will do well. Next uh, item on the agenda is the recognitions, and the first one is the uh, North Carolina uh, National Outstanding Assistant Principal of the Year, and that is Dr. Hartness. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the audience, um, I received a letter on November the 1st from the North Carolina Principals and Assistant Principals Association. And I'd ask Ms. Brittany Holland to come up and join me. The letter said, I am pleased to inform you that Ms. Brittany Holland, Assistant Principal at William R. Davey Elementary School, has been selected as the 2018-2019 North Carolina National Outstanding Assistant Principal of the Year. Ms. Holland is going to serve as North Carolina's representative at the National Association of Elementary and Secondary Principals National Outstanding Principal of the Year program, which recognizes outstanding elementary and middle school assistant principals who have demonstrated success in leadership, curriculum, and personalization. Ms. Holland, along with other assistant principals of the year across the nation, will be invited to attend the National Principals Conference in Spokane, Washington in July of 2019, and her expenses and registration will be paid for by the North Carolina Principals Association. She will also be recognized in March of 2019 at the North Carolina Annual Meeting in Raleigh. I would like to thank and congratulate Principal Karen Stevens, who wrote Brittany's recommendation for recommending her for this honor. We are honored and excited for Brittany 
that you have earned this distinguished award, and you're going to represent our state and our county in a national competition. Congratulations. I think that's a first. <laughs> uh, next recognition is the William Ellis uh, volleyball team. And Jeff Wallace and Mike Apsher, or just Jeff? Thank you, Chairman Junker. Uh, Coach Apsher could not be with us tonight. He is, uh, they're, they're actually scrimmaging at West Iredale, but <clears throat> so I will be glad to recognize two of our fine teams tonight, one the first being William Ellis middle school volleyball team, and at this time, Coach Wallace and Coach Little, please. Do you guys step forward and share with us? I'd like to, I will turn, come on over. <laughs> yeah, we don't have any faces or hold up or anything unless your kids do, I'm not sure about that. So that's kind of a hard act to follow, but um, I'm very appreciative of both of these young ladies taking uh, on this responsibility. and. As we've said, I've stated from this podium many, many times, you're teaching more than just volleyball. But it never hurts when you go undefeated for two years in a row. So that's always helpful. When you have good players, it makes coaching a little bit easier, a little bit. So, But I will ask uh, Coach Little and uh, Miss Wallace here, Coach Wallace, to share. It's just unusual me to say Coach Wallace. <laughs> so, that's all right. I like it. No offense to you. That's, that's my name. Um, Anyway, just share with us a few things about your team and your young ladies, and we'd love to have them to come up and be recognized as well, okay? Well, first of all, thank you for having us here to recognize our team. Unfortunately, our girls could not come tonight because a lot of them do club ball on Tuesdays, and last Tuesday we did an award ceremony at Ellis Middle School. So none of them are here, but we are very happy to um, accept recognition for them and pass it along to them. This year we had an amazing team. It was um, about half eighth graders and half new coming from different backgrounds of skill level, but they came together as a team and it was really amazing to be able to see. Um, I am the assistant coach and I kind of get to see how um, she coaches them to be a united front and that was a beautiful thing to be able to see this year. Uh, they did not lose a single set. We had the second time in Ellis history that a girl served an entire 25 points without having it be lost against them. The first one being, I believe, Miss Lauren Grooms over here. Um, but it was, I could not help it because I'm the scorebook keeper. And I was just like, I don't know where to go on the scorebook because it just, it doesn't go that far. But it was amazing to get to see. They work together and I can't wait to see what they do up at the high school. So again, thank you for recognizing us and we'll pass it along to our girls. Next recognition is probably very appreciative of what she just heard. <laughs> Never hurts. Uh, 25 in a row. Lauren, that's got to be hard, just the mental piece of that. I'm used to just, that. just, <laughs> Morgan. She's so Morgan. Oh, okay. That, all right, all right, all right, all right. I thought you were trying to make fun of your friend. All right. Chairman Junker and the board, it's my honor to recognize tonight our Davie County High School varsity volleyball team and the CPC tournament champions. And I would like to ask um, Miss Coach Brandon to step forward, please, and then have her young ladies to step up. And uh, we'd like for you to recognize some of those and talk about your team, please. Coach Brandon. Y'all can just line up up there. We don't all have to crowd the microphone. Um, so Lauren never served 25 in high school. I don't know what happened. Um, for the past couple years, this group for me has kind of been um, what most, most coaches would talk about as their dream team. Um, their season really started last spring when somehow they convinced Coach Lewis to meet them multiple days a week in the weight room. Um, for workouts. And if you've ever taken a group of 16 and 17 year old girls in the weight room, half the time with the football team, it's sometimes a challenge. Um, but 
um, tryouts began and they quickly were faced with um, what some days seemed like an impossible non-conference schedule and we had our first round of injuries and then we lost the second match of the season. Um, and so from there, it was a turning point. They went on um, an 18-game win streak, which led them to be the conference champions for the first time since 2002. Um, they went perfect in the conference tournament and won that for the first time since 1987. And then they earned the number one seed in the state playoffs in the Western region. Um, so this group of girls includes five seniors who will graduate as the winningest class in Davie Volleyball history plus one of the most talented groups of juniors, sophomores, and freshmen this program has ever had that contributed to these successes. Their goal was to sell out for each other every match and to represent their school and community with pride, and they did it. Um, you guys have given Davie High School and Davie County so much to be proud of. Okay, back up. I'm gonna introduce them real quick. Um, so senior Emma Slaybach, just came from basketball practice. Um, senior Lauren Grooms, senior Morgan Flores, sophomore Elizabeth Tilly, sophomore Dylan Everhart, junior Carmen Tomlin, senior Kara Terry, junior Zoe Clark, junior Dakota Hutchins, senior Abby Wilkins, freshman Amy Loy, sophomore Mackenzie Stakely, junior Angela Samora, and freshman Allie Angel. One final word, if I may. Coach Brandon, I want to say thank you for, for your dedication to this team. Uh, Coach Lewis, and, uh, but also the dedication you have in our classroom. Uh, Ms. Brandon there teaches chemistry this time. And uh, she's heavy, uh, involved with STEM and some other things. So we're very proud of her. She works hard both in the classroom and obviously outside the classroom. But I want to say thank you to all. I know some parents are here. Parents, thank you as well. As we easy say, and it's not token, we couldn't do it without you. And I know it takes a lot of your time. And ladies, congratulations. And uh, thank you for what you're doing in your representation of uh, Davie County Schools in our county. Thank you very much. Thank you again, and thank you for being here. Now is the time if you wanted to sneak out, we won't even know you're leaving. <laughs> or you could stay for another hour. <laughs> Now we're down to the dedicated. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda, and I will entertain a motion. I have a motion by Ms. Horn. I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Fuller. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Uh, next uh, item is a business item. The first item on this, uh, uh, first item that we have up here is, whoa, hold on one sec, is the interim superintendent. Um, as everyone knows, we are um, losing Dr. Hartness in the current position. Uh, fortunately for us, he's not going far. Uh, and also, fortunately for us, uh, he has left us in an incredible position, um, in a position of leadership position of key people and uh, key positions that are getting the work done. Um, I've always read the, the, the best leaders are those that can leave and things keep going. Um, and I think he's done that. And that's a testimony to him, but it's also a testimony to the staff and everyone else that's in the, in the positions. Uh, we're also in the fortunate position to have uh, someone like Dr. Bill Steed uh, that we can call on uh, for this interim uh, position. 
And so we're really excited uh, after doing a search, uh, the, the best person is right in front of us um, to come in and to continue on the path that we're going uh, until we can find the permanent uh, replacement. Uh, and he will begin in January. Uh, but at this time, I will entertain a motion. I make a motion that we uh, appoint Dr. Steed as the interim superintendent until a permanent superintendent can be found. Beginning in January 1, correct. Beginning January 1st. I have a motion, I have a second. Uh, any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Uh, next item, turn it over to uh, Dr. Hartness for a property lease. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 1998, the Board of Education in the town of Coolamy entered into an agreement um, for a small area on the back side of the Coolamy Elementary property. I've attached to your agenda item an aerial view of that. Uh, the area is approximately 100 feet by 100 feet. It's in the very back corner. It's adjacent to Hickory Street, and it, the town of Coolamy maintains that property provides liability insurance for that property, and uh, there's a basketball court on that piece of property. Uh, the town of Coolamy has approached our staff. The lease was for 20 years and is now expired, and the town would like to renew that lease for five years at $20 per year, and staff would recommend that the board consider um, extending this lease agreement. Any questions? Since I had the privilege of negotiating the first lease, I would like the privilege of, of uh, motioning that we accept this uh, extension of the lease as presented by the superintendent. Thank you. I have a motion. I have a second by Ms. Owens. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, I'll call on uh, George Selecki for the uh, Child Nutrition Food and Supply Distributor Termination. Good evening, Chairman Jocker, Dr. Hartness, and board members and staff. Um, this summer, an invitation for bid was sent to Cisco, U.S. Foods, Gordon Foods, on behalf of the Foothills Co-op, which includes Davey Yakin, Surrey Stokes, Alexander, and Mount Airy City Schools for food supplies and paper products for this school year 2018-2019. Cisco came in as the lowest bidder and was board approved for the 18-19 school year. However, since the beginning of school, each member of the co-op has had numerous and ongoing issues related to Cisco's service. Examples include out of stock and substitutions. Early in May of 2018, we provided an estimated product usage to Cisco. And since the beginning of school, we've had, we have been receiving substitutions that that are not comparable to pack size and price to what is on the bid. This affects not only our menus, but also our students with allergies and at the end of the day, our bottom line. Net off invoice for commodity items or NOI, if you will. NOI items are not consistently stocked. Credit has not been consistent on invoices and in turn, we are not receiving the benefit of commodity credit. Commodity bank balances were not set up to draw down commodity pounds. And for a first time this year, starting this year, the state will sweep all remaining pounds not used by July. Invoices, invoice corrections have to be made on each invoice. Members of the Foothills Co-op requested corrected invoices before payment and were told that they did not have the capability to do this. Commodity storage, an inventory process was not in place to order and deliver our commodities. Routing, routing has not been provided to districts in a timely manner all school year. And finally, communication. Effective communication from Cisco has been a challenge since the inception of the bid process. So the co-op, along with the North Carolina Procurement Alliance and DPI, have agreed that according to Section 32.4 of the North Carolina Procurement Alliance distrib Distributor Contract, this contract may be terminated in whole or in part by either party in the event of substantial failure by the other party to fulfill its obligations under contract through no fault of the terminating party. Cisco was given a 30-day notice of intent to terminate and an opportunity for consultation with the Foothills Co-op to rectify defects in performance. Issues have not been rectified 
and the Foothills Co-op has voted unanimously to terminate the contract with Cisco pending board approval. So tonight I'm asking you to vote to officially terminate the contract with Cisco and award the next lowest bidder, U.S. Foods, as our approved vendor for the remainder of the 18-19 school year. Any questions? And are all the school systems doing the same thing <coughs> tonight or whenever they meet to make it? Yes. Every school system is going to vote individually, and then, Mrs. Wilson, we vote. Unfortunately, I haven't been involved with the co-op, so I don't know the structure of the co-op, um, and I can't. I'll, I'll address that. I'm the, not prepared to answer. I haven't seen the co-op constitution. The fiscal agent of the co-op is Surrey County Schools, correct? correct? And the co-op is represented by legal counsel, Fred Johnson. So Mr. Johnson has been a part of this um, negotiation and meeting with Cisco and representing the co-op. So um, he has advised each of the, the, the member school districts the, the actions to take. So this would be action that would be very similar to all the other boards of education. I assume that, that all the school systems are going to use the same, still the same provider. U.S. Foods, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes. First thing is, congratulations for catching it, that, that there were shortages, that there were exchanges made that were inappropriate. That means that some, some bodies are on the ball paying attention to that. Absolutely. So congratulations to you for that and the other people in the co-op that recognize that. Um, up on the date of termination or end of the contract, what position are we in what has been paid for but not delivered? and or equalization of what's owed and what's been paid for? We have been going through each individual invoice, which has been very tedious for, for my department of three. Um, and basically what we've been doing is going line by line and correcting their pricing, correcting the credits that we should receive and short paying them. And what was the other question? I'm sorry. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. All right. Board, I would just say that this is a perfect example of um, school districts partnering together to get the best prices and excellent fiscal oversight by um, our child nutrition director. So I really appreciate George. George has been through a lot along with his colleagues of trying to settle this and sort it out, but they've done a great job. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, entertain a motion. I have a motion by Ms. Owens. Do I have a second? I have a second by Colonel Hills. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you again. It wouldn't be a school board meeting without Michael Spillman. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the chiller, chiller replacement for Conancer Elementary. Be nice. Board, Dr. Hart and staff, I am here tonight to uh, bring a few topics to you tonight. And uh, the first one is the chiller replacement for Conancer Elementary School. Due to a major compressor failure on the chiller at Conancer, staff contracted Consulting Engineering Services to consult and write specifications to replace the chiller um, staff rec uh, requested prices from train, carrier, Daikin, uh, directly. Bids were opened and accepted on October 9th, 2018. Staff recommends entering a purchasing contract for a 140-ton Daikin chiller with Hoffman & Hoffman, uh, Patterson Street, Greensboro, for the amount of $90,509. Additional expenses, including sales tax and consulting fees, for the total budget of $102,600. Is there any questions? About how old is that unit that's being 18 replaced? years old. 18, is that all? Yeah, it was installed in 2000. So. Any, any other questions? Entertain a motion. 
have a motion by Mr. Fuller, second by Colonel Hills. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Yeah, in our, uh, in our 10 year facilities study that we did, it was uh, due to be replaced in 2021. But the compressor itself was going to cost like $30,000 to replace, so it wasn't. just directed to buy a new chiller at this point so I'll let you carry on all right um, <laughs> now um, we also contracted with uh, consulting engineering services to uh, consult and write the spec the specifications to install the chiller and a st uh, we held a staff held a mandatory pre-bid meeting October 31st 2018 at 8.30 a.m. Professional Air Services, Web Heating and Air, Commercial Air Services, and Air One Industries and Associated Heating and Air Conditioning were invited to bid. Professional Air Systems, Associated Heating and Air Conditioning, Commercial Air Systems attended the pre-bid meeting. Bids were opened at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, November 7, 2018. Staff recommends contracting with Associated Heating and Air Conditioning for the amount of $38,400. Staff also recommends accepting Alternate 1 in the amount of $9,050 for the total amount of $38,400. Any questions? Mr. Spillman, I yes, don't sir. have that chart that you just spoke of, the comparison chart. Mm -hmm. I don't have that in front of me. But um, a lot of the business that we do, it, there is a requirement to use the most appropriate, least expensive service. I, I don't know if I'm saying the words right. L lowest responsible bidder. That's yes. Mm -hmm. that, is that the case? In That is not the case in this issue, or it is? Uh, it is actually. They were um, the Daikin chiller was the lowest okay. bid price on the I chiller, was at that and Associated was the lowest bidder for the install. And we did that separately to expedite the process of getting it replaced, so we could go ahead and reserve a chiller that was actually on hand that they didn't have to make or build because it was going to be several it would be a couple of months before we got it at that point so that was the process that we went through to get this any other questions i'll entertain a motion for the bid and alternate correct i have a motion by mr drexler do i have a second i have a second by mr potts any further discussion all those in favor motion carries seven zero you're up again. Uh, yes, replacement sir. Replacement water heater for Canasser. Yes. Um, two days after we determined that the chiller was going to be replaced, the main water, one of the main water heaters uh, sprung a leak. So, with that said, the main water heaters for Canasser School must be replaced. So, Davie County Schools accepted quotes from four vendors last year when replacing the heater at William Ellis Middle. Taking warranty, reliability, and maintenance and price into consideration, it is recommended to, uh, that the staff purchase two PBI water heaters from Thermal Resource Sales for the amount of $60,614. It is also recommended that, um, that staff approve the budget to resolution of this amount for the capital outlay funds for this purchase. Any questions? Any questions? They had a 15 year warranty and they're 18 years old. So. Okay. Questions? Do I have a motion? I have a motion by Mr. Trexler. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Fuller. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. All jokes aside, thank you for what you and your team do. Very to welcome. Keep it's an honor and privilege to work for David County Schools. <laughs>
trying to be serious. I was too. No, seriously, thank you guys. You guys uh, do a great job. Uh, next item on the agenda is the walkie-talkie uh, project. That sounds weird to even say. Yeah, walkie-talkie. Walkie -talkie. <laughs> Uh, thank Miller. you, thank you, Chairman Junker, members of the board, Dr. Hartness. Um, you have before you this evening a business item to um, to purchase hand radios and equipment and licenses and frequencies for each of our three middle schools um, to replace the current walkie-talkies um, that are failing and do not meet current FCC res regulations. And um, these funds would be used to procure 20 hand radios per site and the supporting equipment um, to be identified during the, ins the uh, implementation. And uh, it is our request that you approve $20,000 of capital outlay funds to be available for this purchase. Does anyone have any walkie-talkie questions for <laughs> Ms. Miller? I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, Okay, so the $20,000 for this and replacement of those for that particular school. But do you know what the status is with regard to the rest of the schools with regard to walkie-talkies? Okay, this, this is 20 for each of the three, so this three middle for, schools. This okay. will cover the three middle schools. Okay, so we still the got... High school, the high school, I believe... Let's ask Mr. Rooney to come to the yes, podium and discuss you. that. Thank you. Good evening, board. Walkie-talkies, hand radios, it's a great conversation to have, but uh, what we have seen is the FCC has uh, changed its regulation this two times, and the regulation now, you have to have an FCC-endorsed radio in any private sector or public sector or health and safety organization. Um, of course, we have procured a lot of our hand radios. There are walkie-talkies. What we're recommending are hand radios before this ruling came about. So, Mr. Hale, Colonel Hale, in, in your reply, will... Uh, we will look at the other schools as we plan our next year's capital outlay budget because they're functioning. We're going to get through and do a phased approach. But our middle schools are seeing problems, and we want to add that to our safety systems analysis. As you know, we've done a lot of work on our safety systems, and this goes hand in hand with that process to make our safety systems better in all accounts. So. Mr. Rooney, those handheld radios were replaced at Davie County High School when we yes. opened the new school, correct? Yes, they, they were all FCC approved. Um, the design there was substantial. As you know, it's a big facility. Um, Eddie and I were just talking. We've not received one work order since opening that school about those handhelds. Thank you. Any other questions? You made a recommendation from staff that we approve 20000 for that? Correct. Um, earlier, I, I think I heard a combination of asking for someone to make that motion and vote and call for a vote, but it included the budget adjustment for it. Do you want to add the budget adjustment to that, or does it need to be a separate? Since we, we have several items tonight, I have one budget amendment that will cover all the items. It's sure. coming up. Uh, in two more items. Any you know other questions? Entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Drexler. I have a second. <clears throat> I have the second by Ms. Horn. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Uh, next item on the agenda uh, is back to Ms. Miller for the. Um, Lottery funds for Cranaster Elementary School. Thank you, uh, Chairman Junker. Uh, this, I this business item is for the board to approve the use of $102,600 of lottery funds from the state for the, um, for the chiller replacement at Cranaster Elementary. And this is the application that will, will be signed by the board uh, to, uh, for the use of those funds. And then the application goes over to the county and the commissioners will then in turn approve and then we'll get those funds from, from the state for this project. Any questions? Is this the amendment that you're asking for? No, the next item is the budget amendment. 
motion? I have a motion by Ms. Owens. I have a second by Colonel Hills. All those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. Now, you're back on it. Ms. Miller for the Capital Alley Budget Amendment. Thank you. And this is my final budget amendment for Davie County Schools. Oh. <laughs> And this amendment is to use $102,600 of lottery funds for, for the uh, Chiller project and $20,000 of, um, of the unbudgeted funds for the, uh, the Walkie Talkie project. And let's see here. Yes, and, th and that, those funds will come from the... Um, then there's the $60,614 $60, for the, um, the uh, water heaters that's coming from the capital outlay fund balance. So three different sources for the three different projects. Is there anything else you want to say? That's it? No, I, I just request that you approve this final budget amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we better. <laughs> Any questions? Who wants to be the one? Right here. Seven Colonel seven. Hills. No question. <laughs> I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Drexler. All those in favor? <clears throat> Motion carries 7 0. Great Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the public address to the board. Board members, as we approach Thanksgiving, your audience and constituents want you to get home and get started cooking so they have no comments today. Perfect. Uh, next is uh, staff reports, and we have Manufacturing Day. Uh, I'm going to turn it. Let's see. Who we got? Uh, Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, guests, Dr. Hartness, I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight and hearing about our manufacturing day. It was a great experience, again, a new experience for me, but it was something that I thoroughly enjoyed helping to uh, organize. Uh, worked with Carolyn McManamy, uh, who at the time was with the Chamber of Commerce and is now working with our uh, Economic Development Council. Uh, she was imperative in doing all of this. She contacted all the businesses. She did all the outreach for this, and it was it was wonderful to have her on my team and, and working on this. Uh, the other folks, of course, that had a huge part in this were the principals, assistant principals, and teachers of the middle schools. They helped organize that end of it, and we all kind of worked together. Transportation department helped us out with getting buses. Uh, Donna did a great job with that. It was just a big collaborative effort on making this happen and uh, it actually it, it ran smoothly. Uh, we had very few hiccups. There are some things as, as any time that you deal with something of this magnitude, uh, things that we want to work on, things that we want to continue to do to make it better. Uh, the ones that were involved of course were eighth graders um, and all of our eighth graders in the county were involved in this. Uh, again, Ec Economic Development Council, Chamber of Commerce, businesses, uh, everybody was involved. DCCC was a huge part in this. Um, and in fact, when we were looking for businesses, DCCC contacted us and said, if you have other groups that you need to send, we will take as many as you will as you'll send us. So they were a great partner in this as well. So we had a lot of, a lot of help with this. Um, everybody that was involved, of course, is listed here. Our businesses were Pro Refrigeration, Gildan, uh, Dex, DCCC, uh, Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, Davey uh, Medical Center, um, Ashley Furniture, Ingersoll Rand. They all, again, were very welcoming to our students, um, gave our students a lot of hands-on experiences in their uh, buildings and, and showed them different things that were available in our local businesses. This was a great opportunity for our eighth graders to get out there, to get involved, to see what was in our communities. And again, it, it was a tremendous effort. And I have uh, Mary Orr to thank for making all these great uh, 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 visuals. She did several of those and she did a great job with that. But again, it was a big collaborative effort of everyone involved and there's a few pictures of our students uh, doing various things at the businesses and again it was just a it was just a great experience altogether businesses were very welcoming very warm they want to do more of this uh, we're hoping to eventually expand expand this 
not only with just manufacturing day on, on that uh, uh, first week in October, but expanding it uh, further, maybe getting some of our seventh graders involved, getting some of our high school students involved, and uh, this is what we're hoping to be able to do. But uh, again, great collaborative effort on everybody in the community and in the schools to have make this happen. So it was, it was a great experience all the way around. Any questions? That's great. How did the, as far as the companies that did participate, uh, did you limit it to a certain number or those are the ones that just sort of stepped up the first? Those were the first ones and uh, we, had an, we had an idea of how many we needed to make this happen. Uh, again, working with the schools and getting the numbers and knowing how many students we had, how many buses we had to go in those uh, different places. Um, uh, it was just kind of a logistics thing of figuring that out. We could have taken more businesses, but that was kind of what we had at that point. Um, and again, with the focus being, since it is a national manufacturing day, we did try to focus it with, with advanced manufacturing. Um, in fact, Ashley Furniture, they took a group from each school. So Ashley Furniture had three buses uh, that stayed the entire time at Ashley Furniture. The other groups would go out and say, um, take for instance Ellis, uh, the, the students from William Ellis, you had one group that stayed all day at Ashley Furniture, the other group went to Dex and then went to uh, Davy Medical Center and then they flip-flopped halfway through the day. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we tried to get as much exposure out there as possible but still being able to tour. Ashley is such a large facility and the fact that they um, they wanted to have students there all day so that's why we left those students there so we hope to be able to again continue to expand this and make it make it larger and, and maybe even make it longer throughout the day so that students can go to multiple places well, it's just a win-win for everybody yes it, yes it is it's awesome all right I got a comment I, I think that is an excellent program that, that we should only grow to include those high school kids because a lot of those kids might very well see an occupation that they want to be yes. for the rest of their life. So from a job finding standpoint and a and requirement standpoint for certain jobs, we cannot give them too much exposure. I agree. You know, so that, that is a great tool and I just, I just hope that it'll continue and grow into the high school and, and, and continue for years. Because I think it's a great opportunity yes, for those kids that aren't necessarily locked in for college. And we do try to, of course, starting with the eighth grade, that's kind of a national thing with extreme STEM tours, is hitting that group before they get into high school and start making those decisions on schedules and everything. But I agree 100%. I think we, again, the more exposure we can have for these students going out into the businesses, just like our externships, getting teachers out there so that they can talk to students about it, the more that we can do this, the better off we're going to be. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Empower DC, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Jenda Haynes. Good evening, Chairman Junker, board members, guests. We are pleased tonight to introduce to you a new drug awareness and prevention program that's called Empower DC. So I want you to take a look at this official logo. We think that's pretty powerful. This is truly a partnership between the Davie County Sheriff's Department and Davie County Schools. And so um, Officer Jeff Jones, our lead resource officer, and Amanda Beck, our lead middle school counselor, will be joining me and chiming in as we present this to you. I'm gonna start just by giving you a little bit of background. You all are aware that um, we have partnered with the Sheriff's Department for many years and have provided DARE education in our elementary schools, specifically at fifth grade. Um, DARE stands for Drug Abuse Resistance Education, and it, that curriculum originally focused more on reducing the use of tobacco and alcohol. Um, and again, the curriculum was presented to all fifth graders district-wide. So the way that that looked is we had one DARE officer that visited each of the elementary schools approximately 10 days, either in spring semester or fall semester, and then there was a culminating graduation um, that included their DARE essay contest. Um, At this point in 2018, we can't turn on the news or pick up a newspaper without seeing these kinds of national headlines. Um, our schools are obviously a reflection of the community that we live in, um, and we want to be proactive about preparing students for choices that they will face as they go on. Um, these are national stories, these are, these are national headlines, um, but these are risks that our students face that we really want to, again, be proactive and address. 
just as our mission statement says, we want to equip and empower. And so it's interesting that our task force, as we came together and tried to come up with a logo and what, what do we want to call this, we wanted to, uncall, we wanted to call this Empower DC. So we gathered a task force, and this task force included originally both elementary and middle school um, staff, as well as representatives from the Sheriff's Department and some of our SROs. And this has been going on, honestly, for months. It's taken a long time to get to where we are tonight. Um, we reflected on the curriculum model that we had with DARE. Um, we discussed the needs that we're seeing, the concerns that we have, looking at the data that we have at the national and state level, and even what we can see within our schools. We started researching what kind of programs are out there, what kind of resources are there, um, and what do we think might be effective or more effective. And so as we developed this program, we were really looking for something that would be a little more updated, that would address current concerns and trends, that would be more timely, um, and that really would give us an opportunity to, to support positive relationship building between SROs, especially now that we have an SRO in each of our middle schools, and we're blessed to have that situation. So we landed um, with a program that's called Project Alert. Um, it's an evidence-based program, and there are 12 lessons from Project Alert that we're really focusing on. The um, drug lessons, which will be led by the SROs through health and PE classes, and then there are also lessons that are more focused on pressure, resistance, um, and how to make good life choices. And those will, will be um, incorporated by teachers through the DC Proud that we already have underway. As we talked about timing, um, that was really, that was really um, a, a challenge for us. Um, looking at the best time to have these conversations, sixth grade is where we really landed. The beginning of sixth grade fall semester is a lot of transition as they're moving from elementary to middle school, but we felt like spring of sixth grade was the, was the target um, and the best time before they reach seventh grade and maybe before um, having some other exposure. So I'm going to ask Officer Jones and Amanda Beck to come up and talk more specifically about their lessons. Good evening, board. Dr. Hartness, Mr. Wallace. Um, Sheriff Hartman couldn't be here tonight. He wanted me to let you guys know he's at the Sheriff's Academy in Chapel Hill, but he's 100% behind this, too, and uh, we've obviously been keeping him in the loop of everything that's going on. Um, having the extra SRO, I appreciate you guys know helping us out with that it, may, it really makes a big difference for something like this um, Brockwell Gant Cranford um, they'll be leading these classes and we'll be talking about that and going over with them what they're doing the biggest advantage I see in this is we're going to be able to let our SROs get every sixth grader that comes into the middle school and build relationships with them during these classes and they're gonna have two more years with those kids building relationships based off of this class and getting them educated. Um, I've been at the high school nine years. I've done drug classes for seven. The first two years I didn't do it and I saw a need for it because you know, I would charge incoming freshmen and sophomores you know, with drugs and I'd be like, yeah, we need to get in front of it somehow. Um, I've been adding to that presentation with all the new drugs that keep coming out. We talk about updating with the opioid crisis um, that we have now. Um, all the ninth graders, we kind of hit them age appropriate. We hit, I've added, um, you know, the prescription drugs we always hit, but now I tie in the opioids, the Oxycontin, the Percocet, and how that can lead to, op to opioid addiction and heroin. Um, we talk about that now. We didn't do that three years ago because heroin, heroin was not a problem in Davie County three years ago. It is now. Um, the dab pins are, dab pins are what you smoke marijuana wax in. Wax is new. Um, they take butane, they heat up marijuana, they extract the THC. It's about five times more potent than regular marijuana. They melt it down to wax and they smoke it in a dab pen. A dab pen looks just like a vape pen. Um, we've gotten them off of kids. We've transported kids to, you know, um, from the high school with, with having issues with that. So I've added that in there as well. Um, if we can build these kids from the middle school up to get to the high school. I get them with more updated in ninth grade. In the sixth grade, they're gonna get more updated. Um, sixth grade, I think, is better than fifth grade. I think fifth grade, they're kinda of king, of king of the school. 
everything's still innocent, say no to drugs, and, and that's always been, you know, D.A.R.E. was a good program, but I just feel like this is going to be better in sixth grade. Once they get settled and they're in the second part of sixth grade, they may see some kids maybe smoking tobacco in the bathroom, know a few kids that might smoke marijuana. It's more real to them, so I think you can reach them better in sixth grade. So I look forward to um, implementing um, this in the middle schools. I think it's going to help. Any questions? Just overall, community-wide, how important is this? I mean, this isn't just a school issue. No, it's not. And you know, um, we have drugs in Davie County. Okay? We have every child in the county is at the high school. Um, is it as bad as bad in the in the bigger cities? Absolutely not. Okay, we don't have a huge drug problem, but we do have kids that experiment with drugs. So the more we can get in front of them, the more we're going to be able to help them. Some of these kids, they go home to it. That's all that. You know, that's all that they see. So this is the only positive that they're going to get. I mean, educational, why it's not good. So, um, yeah, it's going to have a good impact in the schools, but also I think overall in the community too, because these kids get out. And when I work the road in the summer, I deal with some of the same kids that I deal with at high school, you know, when they get out of school. So. I just want to add to that. When we, when we really started looking at our data, we look at um, even what we can, can access through our local health department. We see that the, um, the majority of any kind of overdose, or particularly related to op opioids, is 20 to, age 20 to 49. Um, when we look at drug use, we see a real uptake really after they graduate. Um, again, the idea is to be proactive. We do care about, we care about our students after, after they're gone. Um, and so we do want to be proactive. We want them to be prepared to make good life choices even after they leave us. Okay. Um, so one of the wonderful things about using a hybrid model is it's 12 lessons. The SROs are going to take four of those that center around the actual drug information. The other eight are going to be taught by teachers that the students know through DC Proud. So the SROs are using their content knowledge, but then we're doing these smaller breakout groups that are very much rich in discussion and collaboration and things like that. Um, so those topics are more, what are the social pressures around drugs? How do you resist that? And then building kids up with the skills to actually do that. Because sometimes we assume if we tell them this is what you do, that they can then go do it, and we leave out that skill piece. And so we want to make sure that we are equipping them with the skills to resist as well as the knowledge. So a sample lesson might be they start with a video that kind of hooks them in with a real life situation that's age appropriate. Um, the video doesn't have a resolution to it and so the video stops and it sparks a discussion around what they saw in the video and brainstorming some possible responses to it. Um, they might practice by developing skits where they act out the possible ways to respond and then give feedback to each other about, well, you could have said this or this is another option. And then each of the lessons has a homework component to engage students in conversations with either a parent or a trusted adult about what they're learning. Um, the other great thing about having the SROs and the teachers working together is it gives them multiple positive adult role models. So they're not just hearing this from officers, they're also hearing this from other people in the school building that they respect. I think it's also important to think about this. So the Empower DC is an important piece, but it's not a standalone piece. Children don't say, I want to grow up to be an addict. And yet as adults in this room, probably all of us either have struggled with addiction ourselves or know somebody who has. It's a complex problem that requires complex solutions. And so Empower DC is one pillar of a web of interventions that include DC Proud, the overall character education program, and Compassionate Resilience Schools. And these three things work together to build long-term protective factors like pro-social skills, um, self-regulation skills, a deep connection to the community, um, a sense of purpose and long-term goals. And so Empower DC isn't a standalone. It fits into all of these other things to create a really comprehensive approach. Can you want to grab it? 
So as you all know, their graduations have been a big deal for fifth graders. They've been a big deal in our elementary schools. Um, so we know that culminating events are important. Um, pledging and making, committing yourself um, to staying clean, those things are important. So as this task force talked about culminating events, um, we talked about incorporating this within the sixth grade awards ceremony, incorporating certificates. Many of our students, we do believe, would like t-shirts with Empower DC logo on them. Um, at North Davy, where they have the Pincentive program, they may want pins instead of t-shirts. So those logistics need to be worked out and they may, they may look a little differently from one school to the other, but we know that this will be part of their sixth grade awards ceremony. Um, the Sheriff's Department does want to continue supporting 15 students going to summer camp. So we'll be able to send five students um, from each school to go to summer camp. And we'll try to target those that we feel will, will benefit most from that experience. Um, one thing that is new is the Sheriff's Department really wants to work hard to provide some kind of long-term incentive. Um, so they are talking about developing a career or college scholarship or career and college scholarship. Um, so that a student or multiple students can be selected at the end of their senior year um, as part of this Empowered DC initiative. There is some, some investigation of a sixth grade field trip. We, we need to see how that will work with PBIS rewards trips already, but that's also something um, that we're looking into as part of this process. So at this point, do you have questions for any of the three of us? You may have said, but what uh, time of the day are these, or are they coming out through a particular program, health and physical education, or? It will be through health and PE. So that will be different at different schools depending on when, what time of day that's scheduled with sixth grade. Okay, and my comment, um, the last session I attended at the uh, school board association meeting this afternoon was about the brain development of children who use alcohol. So um, we had conversation on the way home about the D.A.R.E. program and what some of the other board members of other systems had said. Um, but it was interesting to me and I was glad to see there's a, a homework because of the comment that the, the presenter from ABC board made today was saying that on a survey that was conducted with 500 uh, students in the grade seven in North Carolina and then conducted a survey of 500 adults with similar type questions and the questions had to do with um, things that we've seen before like uh, to a seventh grader, is there a drug use, do you know somebody who uses drugs or drink alcohol in this, in this particular example? But the point to be made was what the students said was so different than what the parents perceive according to this survey. Parents don't think we, that my children are involved in that or around other kids who might use alcohol or, or drugs. Whereas the students were reporting, like 87%, I believe was the statistic he threw out, from the seventh graders who had been exposed to, the, uh, to alcohol mm -hmm. versus 39% of the parents who said, my child has probably been exposed to alcohol. So glad to see a homework component because that could be the link that makes parents get involved and ask some questions about what's going on. So thank you very much. I got a comment. Um, I think your idea for this is phenomenal. Uh, and, and I've been to many D.A.R.E. graduations in my life, if I never go to another one. <laughs> but I believe in it, and so I would continue to go. But, but I think that in the best interest of Davy County, mm -hmm. to move that up to the middle school level. And I agree with the philosophy behind let's do with the, start with the sixth graders. I think that is exactly on target of where we need to be. Uh, so, you know, I congratulate you guys for, for, for having the, the insight to look at a possible change and to come up with a change that you've just got through briefing the board. I think that's phenomenal. And I can tell you, after two days over at this conference we just got back with, it's not just Davie County that's got some drug issues. It is throughout North Carolina. The only difference is some counties have got worse problems than we've got. Mm -hmm. but, but the important thing is to get in front of this, and I think you use that term and you're exactly right, to see what we can do to reduce that event. I would only add, I hope something 
is going to go out from our school system to the families that let them know mm -hmm. that there's one been a change with the dare. This is the old way. This is the new way, and this is who it's applicable to. And I think, I think many parents would probably appreciate that, knowing that it's now going to go to sixth graders rather than mm -hmm. at, the, at the the fifth grade. One so huge, that's a plus. Sorry. One huge benefit that we have is that implementing or piloting this spring of 2019 gives us the unique advantage that students in sixth grade this year had DARE last year. Yes. And so this cohort will be able to provide really valuable feedback to us as yes. we tweak this program moving forward. And so that, that will be part of the pilot and building that into the, to the um, culmination. And I like the idea of the sheriff buying into it, not only for that, mm -hmm. but futuristic employment, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding what I heard. Got a great kid in the high school. He stayed drug clean. He, he looks, he, he's looking for a, a law enforcement position, and maybe there could be something here in Davie County for that person. So that's a good thing. Thank you. To follow up with what Terry said, um, I have the opportunity to work with JCPC here in Davie County, and we are putting together for late winter, early spring, a forum. We did this probably about four years ago where we put everything together for the community. And I would like to ask if you may be, once you get through this, that be a part of that forum with us because we are trying to pull in everything new that's happening to show everyone what's going on. We're also gonna talk about Raise the Age with the new law that's coming through in, um, in 2019. So uh, I just want to say this is fantastic. This is right, right where our council has been talking about being proactive, not reactive, and setting the stage for positive. And just thank, thank the team that put it together. It's, it's phenomenal. Well, the other thing I would add is thank you to you guys, but also just the partnership that we have with the Sheriff's Department. Um, whenever we go and travel and you talk to other boards, you just you take things for granted, and it's not that way uh, everywhere. Um, so I appreciate you guys very much. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to wrap up with just a couple comments. I would echo the, the partnership with the Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Hartman being willing to take a look at something that's been effective and make it even better and to make it applicable to our students and our situations. Jeff, I appreciate you in recognizing the, the situations that our students are facing and um, you and our counselors amending your curricula every year to address the things that are happening in our students' lives. And I want the board to know that um, this is a moving target. Many years ago, we talked about smoking and smoking cessation. It wasn't too long, too many years ago, there were smoking areas at schools. You remember that? We've addressed that issue and very seldom do we have issues with cigarettes. But we have seen a sharp increase in suspensions this school year for jewels and vaping. That is the new trend. It has been marketed toward young people. The vendors and the companies that sell these products deny that they were marketed toward young people, but it's pretty evident that people who use those devices not to stop smoking but abuse them as young people are much more likely to become addicted. Uh, I want to share an example with you. Several weeks ago, I had seen the suspension rate going up in our district for jeweling. And I asked one of our middle school principals, I saw five students in a week that had been suspended for jeweling, if I could come out and meet with that group of students. And I sat down with these young people, seventh and eighth graders, and I asked them really hard questions, and they opened up. Every one of their families did this at home, and two of those five admitted that they were already addicted and would not be able to stop if they wanted to. That's a huge issue. This, I think, could be one of the new health crises for young people in America. If you read the news today, there is news out there of some of the jewel manufacturers actually pulling social media ads and pulling some of their products out of convenience stores because the government regulations are coming down on them because their products are being used and abused in ways that they were not designed for. At least that's what they said they were not designed for. It's huge money, 
and it's affecting our young people. So I wanted to share that with you to let you know this is relevant, mm -hmm. this is timely, this is appropriate, and uh, I am just really proud of our team for putting together this task force and putting the many hours they have into this product that can be delivered in our school system and it can be a model for other districts to use as well. So thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, next item on the agenda is the field house update and Mr. Spillman. Thank you, Chairman Junker, board, Dr. Harden's staff. Um, this should be my last report on this project because all of the, um, all the final punch list items were complete. We had final walkthroughs last week. Um, all the cleanup is done. I think the football team used it last week. Um, as you see right here, the, the final look of what the front of the field house looks like with the metal work being painted and, and different things. Um, we, have, we have a good stand of grass coming up and uh, all the HVAC stuff is, is up and working. I have, uh, I'm under contract with the controls company to get that finished up. Plus, um, we have some furniture on order. Um, some final parts of the lockers are supposed to be delivered December 12th, so they will not be installed on your tour. But uh, we'll have everything cleaned up, and like I said, we have some more furniture that's on order too for that. And you can see the finished product here with the sealer on the floor and uh, fire extinguishers up and the LED lights working and uh, they're all motion sensor. This is the, uh, this is the coach's conference room, who, which it has its own separate heat and air system for, for it. And we have a couple of tables set up for there and 12 chairs for the coaches and of all sports to use for a meeting room instead of having to use the, something in the school and having to run a whole wing of the school or something for, for energy savings. There, and here's your hallway with the finished product, plus um, I thank you for the ones that that's not been able to, to get in there, but um, the shower and the bathrooms really look good. The, the tile work was really excellent, and the stall work and everything really looks good there. And I do look forward to being with you on your tour on December 5th. And, um, and we were able to get some furniture from Novant. Novant uh, Health donated like a training table and some cabinetry for the training room itself. So that was a good partnership with them. So here's your finished product with the Walter Robb sign in the Davie County High School Fieldhouse. Any questions or any comments? I don't have a question, but I, I do have a comment. I was in there about a week ago, and that it really turned out nice. I think it's something for us to be proud of and uh, something that will that'll serve the students very well for a long time. I, I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item is the accountability data. Uh, we'll turn it over to Ms. Aaron Fall. Good evening, Chairman Junker, board members, Dr. Hartness, staff members. Um, I'm here tonight for part two. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about some accountability results um, with the new um, ESSA plan. They did um, come out with some more things um, that we'll talk about tonight. The Every Student Succeeds Act also included some provisions to look at your subgroups and to um, meaning have meaningful differentiation between those subgroups so we'll talk about um, how North Carolina is going to do that in their plan and has done that in their plan the data that came out and was presented to the State Board of Education we'll also talk about identifications that happen because of the accountability data that has come out so um, they'll be looking at those subgroups and those schools to see which ones might need additional assistance I also will be bringing to you, I'll combine my two together, and I'll bring you some college uh, readiness test results that have been published for the class of 2018. 
So we're going to get started here by doing a little bit of review from last month, so you get to hear part of it again. Uh, but we do want to talk about school performance grades, and we want to talk about those accountability indicators that are used in the school performance grade. So you'll see up here that they are different for elementary and middle schools and then high school. So high school has several more indicators than the elementary and middle schools do. The green section is all the proficiency or what we call achievement. So that would be your percent proficient. For school performance grades, they are looking at level three and above when you're looking at the different end of grade and end of course test. The yellow part is growth. So we're looking at the growth of students from year to year as measured by EVOS. So we're gonna look at some of both of that data. Uh, school performance grades are calculated between student achievement and growth. So 80% student achievement, so the green part 80%, and 20% growth. There are some business rules that have to be applied to the data. So we get all of our kids, they come in, they take their tests at the end of the school year, and then we take all of that data and we do apply certain business rules to it before we come up with a final answer. So participation is one of them. We are um, required to test 95% of our eligible students when it comes to tests. So if you don't test 95% of your population, they do add those numbers back into the denominator. So essentially they're counted as not proficient students. We don't have a problem with that here in our school system. Uh, so we do test 95% or usually 100% of our students as we go along. Um, but I do want you to know that that's part of it. Partial enrollment is the second part of it. Students have to be enrolled for at least half a year. So you might have a student come in, take the test, but if they haven't been enrolled here for at least half a school year, then they won't be included in the school performance grade. Once they apply those business rules, then they split everybody up into subgroups. Now we've talked about subgroups before. Um, school performance grade subgroups are a little different in that they do combine tests at a school level. So if you think about an elementary school that has third, fourth, and fifth grade EOGs, they are gonna take the, all those EOGs that are given in those three grades and combine them together. So we get some subgroups that we didn't have before because now instead of looking at just one grade level, one subject for 30 participants, we're actually looking at the whole school for 30, per, for 30 participants for any subject. So we do see some subgroups that we haven't seen before in schools. Um, as we look at those subgroups, you will see there's actually two components. There's achievement and growth. We've talked about that. You will see that you have to have 30 for each one of those pieces. So when you're looking at achievement, you have to have at least 30 tests, basically, reading, math, science. You have to have 30 tests. When you're looking at growth, you have to have at least 30 data points in there also. Every student that takes a test and that gets counted in school performance grade can't also get growth, simply because they might not have the history to do so. So in order to calculate growth, they have to have a history of test scores. So if you think about third grade, third grade reading is measured growth between the BOG at the beginning of the year and the EOG at the end of the year for reading. But there is no growth calculation for third grade in math because there's no pretest for that. So we lose some of that there. So you're gonna see, and I just wanted to point that out because you will see in um, the files that were added to Board Docs today, I went ahead and just kind of laid out all the growth in all the different performance grades for all the different subgroups. So you can see them. Um, once I really started looking at it, I thought we really need something so you can just see it. So that's there, but you'll see that there are less entries for growth than there are for the actual school performance grades. And that's just because some of them don't have enough history and so we didn't end up with the same number of subgroups and growth. If you do not get a growth component, then they do calculate your school performance grade based on just your proficiency. So there would be no growth component if you don't see the growth in the file itself. So let's look a little bit at what our school growth designations were. This is what I presented to you last month, but I wanted to give this to you kind of for comparisons um, as we go look at the subgroups. So when you look at our school growth designations, we had 45% of our schools that exceeded the expected growth, we had 27% that met expected growth, and we had 27% that did not meet expected growth. So that, that's the school as a whole. As we go and we start looking at our subgroup growth, I'm gonna let this, fill out here and I'm going to give you a second to look at it. 
I'm going to describe what you're seeing up here because you really kind of have to look at it for a second. On the left-hand side, you see all of the different subgroups. So you have your racial subgroups, and you have the three program subgroups of students with disabilities, English learners, and economically disadvantaged. This particular graph is showing you how many of those subgroups exceeded expected growth, met expected growth, and did not meet expected growth. So we had 11 schools that had subgroups. Not every school had every subgroup, but we did have 11 schools that had subgroups. So when you look up here, there are, for growth, there are 49 subgroups. And so, so you'll see some schools, um, all of our schools had white subgroup and all of our schools had economically disadvantaged. So that's the one that there are actually 11 in there. So that's why I did it by percentages because there are different numbers in each one of those. You'll see our students with disabilities subgroup up there at the top, that 80% of those subgroups met expected growth, 20% did not meet expected growth. When you look at our English learners, 100% of those subgroups met their expected growth. For economically disadvantaged, 18% exceeded their expected growth, 64% met it, and 18% did not meet expected growth. As you look down at the racial groups, you'll see white 27% exceeded, 36% met, 36% did not meet. Two or more races, there were only two schools that had that subgroup, so one met, one did not meet. Hispanic, 13%. Exceeded their expected growth, 88% met. And for our black subgroup, 33% met their expected growth and 67% did not meet. So that's the breakdown of what those look like across the district. Um, of course, you have these files in here that will show you by school exactly which subgroups made which at which school. Um, it's a lot of data to go through, so I'm not going to go through all that tonight, but you do have it. And of course, if you have any questions later on, you're more than welcome to ask. But that is what our subgroup growth looks like. Um, that is what was presented to the board at the beginning of October. Erin, can, yes. can you go back? I certainly can. Just, just help me say with that top subgroup, mm -hmm. explain what that's telling you. 80% of Explain that to me. Right, sir. So students with disabilities, we had every school but one of our schools has a subgroup that's students with disabilities. So every school but the early college had enough test scores for students that with disabilities to have a subgroup. So out of those 10 schools, 80% of those schools essentially, out of the 10 schools, 80% of those schools, their students with disabilities subgroup met their expected growth and 20% didn't. So if you look at it numbers-wise, eight met expected growth and two did not. Does that help? Okay. So that growth is a component of the school performance grades. Um, so it's nice that we now have that growth for subgroups. We've not had that before. Um, it was delayed just a little bit. Evos took some time to come up with that. And so we do have it now. And that is 20% of the school performance grades. I wanted to take you back to last month when I talked about the school performance grades themselves and look at what our schools earned, and then we're going to look at what our subgroups earned, kind of like what we just did with growth. So as far as our schools go, 64% of our schools earned a C, 27% earned a B, and 9% earned an A. So that'll give you some kind of basis as we look at our school performance grades for our subgroups. It's the same type of graph, but it's broken up into five different bits. You have A all the way to F. So the different school performance grades that each one of those groups earned. So if you look up at the top, you'll see, again, students with disabilities. Um, we did have, again, 10 schools that had a students with disabilities subgroup that earned a school performance grade. And 30% of them were a D, 70% of them were an F. And remember, we're talking about 80% proficiency and 20% growth. So as we go through and we look at these, um, I think accountability for subgroups is a great thing. I think knowing what your groups are doing in your schools is um, ideal. I think it, unfortunately that the way North Carolina has decided to do their analysis 
and their representation does not always represent what we're looking for in a subgroup. So if you look at, for example, your students with disabilities or your English learner subgroup, the very definition of those are those that have something that is affecting their educational performance. And so more than likely, the reason that they're there is because they're not proficient. And so what we're really looking for in those subgroups is growth. That's what we want to see. We want to see them moving forward, and if we can keep them moving forward, exceeding that growth every year, then hopefully they'll end up at proficiency at the end of that. Um, unfortunately, the, the state has said 80% proficiency, 20% growth. So that's why you're going to see that we do well with the growth, and you'll see that with the subgroups, there are obviously places we want to look at and places we want to improve on. But you'll see what our growth looks like, and then you turn around and you see our letter grades, and they're different. The two things are different. So here you'll see English learners, 67%, uh, D, 33%, F, economically disadvantaged, 9%, A, 55%, C, and 36%, D. White, 9%, 64%, and 27% for A, B, and C. Two more races, we had uh, B, C's, and D's, and then Hispanic, C's and D's, and Blacks, D's and F's. So those are the different subgroups and the different school performance grades that they earned. And you have, um, again, in your board docs, a file that will show every school, every subgroup, and exactly which school performance grade that they earned. Let's talk about the identifications that come about because of some of this data. So there's two different types of identification. First is CSI, that's Comprehensive Support and Improvement. Um, those are identified, those are the bottom 5% of all Title I schools in the state. Um, that is the main way that you can get identified as a CSI school. The other one is TSI, that's Targeted Support and Improvement. And that's really looking at your subgroups. And it's really looking at your subgroup, um, their school performance grade. So when you look at that um, TSI identification, we did have seven out of our 11 schools that ended up with a TSI designation. So that's 63.6% .6 of our schools. Uh, you get there by, there's two ways you can get there. The first way is by having an F subgroup. So any subgroup that's an F, if your school has one, then you become a TSI um, school. The other way to do that is to have a subgroup that scored low enough that they would have been in that bottom 5%. So those are the two ways you can get there. If you look at North Carolina as a whole, though, out of the 2,357 schools that earned some subgroup school performance grades, 1,648 of them are TSI schools. So 70% of the schools in the state have the designation of TSI. So just for some comparison purposes, and as you go through, um, I was at a conference last week, a meeting last week, and um, from DPI, they were saying that they were at conferences in national levels, and some national, of course, this is all the way across the nation, and that some states were having as many as 80 to 85 percent of their um, schools being in this TSI bucket. Are there any questions about that before I'm, I'm going to move on to ACT and SAT, but before I leave school performance grades and the identifications, I wanted to see if there were any questions about that. Aaron, I want to make a clarification. Before you move to ACT and SAT, yes. everything you've shared with us are based on tests developed by the state of North Carolina, yes. correct? That is correct. So, board, you're getting ready to see a sharp difference in tests developed by the state of North Carolina and A through F grades mandated by the General Assembly and two national assessments called the ACT and SAT that determine how well our students are prepared for college. And you're getting ready to see how magically when our students take the SAT and ACT in 11th and 12th grade that they're extremely compared prepared compared to their peers in the Piedmont Triad and in North Carolina. So it's going to show you a sharp disconnect with nationally recognized assessments that determine college readiness. And if you're all about us creating a fine product, those are two that you definitely want to look at compared to the assessments that have been adopted by the state of North Carolina 
and a grading system adopted by the North Carolina General Assembly. Right. Truly, uh, uh, might let me okay. comment, truly to take those two documents, the, the state man mandated test and the scores thereof, and then so you show them this once, and then you, t you turn over and you show them ACT uh, scores and how they drastically differ. And the ACT and, and the other one are national tests, and the other ones are state mandated test. So you don't have to be very smart to figure out that the state is wrong. And so, you know, they're absolutely, they're, they're different yeah, measures. a big difference right. and, and they're not doing anything about it and that's frustrating. Yes. You explained David County Schools, seven of 11 schools represent 63.6%. Mm -hmm. And then below it, you gave, so you compared to all of North Carolina, 70%. Mm -hmm. What are the percentages on the CSI? Um, there Is are, there a comparison you can share? No, not really. There's only 77 schools in the state that are identified as CSI. So they're not, um, I, as of right now, we don't have a CSI school. So, um, and across the state, there's only 77 that are identified as such. It is the bottom 5% of just Title I served schools. All right, anything else? All right, we're going to move on um, to the ACT. Um, as Dr. Hartness pointed out, this is a very different test. Um, it does look at college and career readiness. As we're going forward, I'll look at, we'll look at two different things with ACT and then we'll look at SAT scores also. Uh, remember that the ACT is mandated by the state of North Carolina for all juniors. So when you look at this in North Carolina and in the state, this is kind of a comprehensive view of um, students that as they graduate and they move on. This is for those that did just graduate in 2018, these scores. So the ACT scores that I gave to you last month are a little bit different because those are for our juniors that took it this past year. So when you look at our average composite scores over time, um, they are very steady, um, both in the state and here in our county. Um, I didn't use the nation's numbers simply because we require the ACT for all of our students and across the nation it's not required for all students. So there's a completely different subset of students that do take those. But when you look here, you'll see um, in 2013-14, 19.5, we had a, um, a swing up in 2016-17, and then this past year we were at 19.6, whereas the state stayed very steady at 19.1 over the last three years. ACT also does some analysis on um, their data as far as they look at students that go on to college that took the ACT and they look at what they scored and they look at those students that have um, a percentage chance of passing the test. So it's basically the minimum score needed on the subject area test to indicate a 50% chance of obtaining a B or higher and a 75% of obtaining a C or higher. So basically that they will be successful in college classes. So we have lots of different, um, you can look at each subject by themselves. Like for example, we have 52% of our students that met that benchmark that we're going on. And remember this is testing all of our students. So not just those that are college bound, but all the students across um, in our district and across the state. And so these are the percent that meet three or four benchmarks. So that really raises it up higher because they had the score as well in English, math, and then social sciences and science. So um, you'll see here that over time we have, um, interestingly enough, we have the uptick, uptick in 15-16 for this one, and then we've been steady at 32% for the past two years. And we can look at SAT scores for the class of 2018. I did go ahead and put the national numbers in here because this is a self-elected uh, pretty much across the country. So um, you'll get kind of your same subset of students that are gonna take it. 
You'll see in 2017, um, SAT did redesign their test in 2016, so we can't compare pre previous years, but the class of 2017 and class of 2018 are up on your screen. You'll see that we did have a rise in scores along with a rise in uh, participation. So we had 40%, the one, numbers in the circles are the participation. So we had 40% in our district participate, class of 2017, 45% participated um, in the class of 2018, and their scores, their average score was higher. Uh, you'll see the same thing uh, in the state. Their participation also went up with scores going up, and scores actually went up across the nation as well but you'll see where we kind of rank all those. In both ACT and SAT, our graduating class was ranked second um, in our region and in the state, um, 16th for ACT and 17th for ACT, unless I got those backwards. But 16th for one, 17th for the other. Out of 115, that is correct. So that was the difference I wanted you to see, that this is a national standardized test all juniors in North Carolina take the ACT. Um, we're ranked number two in the Piedmont Triad among the 16 school districts here and 16th or 17th out of 115 school districts. Folks, our students did not magically get smarter as a junior and senior. The same students who are getting C's, D's, or F's on state mandated assessments. There's a disconnect and I hope that in the future, North Carolina will correct that disconnect because I think it sends the wrong message to our public that public schools are failing our younger students. They're not failing our students. Our students are performing well compared to other students around the nation. And um, I think it's a shame when we as a state would give a label to a subgroup of black students or students with special needs or students that have English as a second language and give them a letter grade of a D or F and not look at the growth that they are making to get on track and to be successful in life or a career. I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you. Then I'll get back on it. Because um, <laughs> I've been a curriculum person my whole time. I think the public needs to understand that these tests are not facts. They're how to apply what they have been taught ever since kindergarten all the way up through high school. That every part of our system played a role in that. These are just application. This is how you apply your knowledge. And for our students to do this, our teachers to really do that extra mile to get to this point really does need to be recognized. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes, sir. I told Mr. Hales and Mr. Potts that I wasn't going to talk about much of what happened at the Greensboro conference, but I just, I, I can't help but say a lot of the breakout sessions, a lot of the speeches and or programs that were offered for us as school board and there were several superintendents there. Um, thank you folks for doing what you do because Davy County is incredibly more productive. Um, from what I heard some of today, we handle problems when they're this big instead of waiting until they get this big. So you were using the word get, get up a front of it earlier. Um, I'll, I'll do better in December or between now and December passing on some information to the other board members. But I was amazed at some of the things that we heard in the last two days. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is policy updates and Dr. Hartness. Board, you're familiar with this. Uh, we have a number of policies uh, for review this month. Um, these have been provided to us by the Policy and Legal Services Division of the North Carolina School Boards Association. Uh, there's nothing substantial to these policy updates other than legal updates or changes due to statute changes. We would ask the board to consider adopting these policies at your December meeting. Thank you very much.
The last item on the agenda is adjournment, and I would allow anyone that has anything final comments. Politicians not wanting to talk. It's good. I'm one of them. Sorry. Just uh, last thing, you'll be missed, uh, Miss Miller. Again, uh, wish you all the best and success, um, and thank you. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I have a motion by Mr. Potts, second by Mr. Drexler. All in favor? Motion is unanimous. Thank you. Have a good evening.